we can um, discuss about the food safety uh, topic uh, in food system transitions in deltas. Food safety is an important element um, and uh, we welcome in particular uh, Katja and Rosa uh, who in Wageningen are working uh, on an integrated way to incorporate these elements in the um, uh, in the food system analysis. Um, we will have today a presentation first by Katja and Rosa, and then we will have room for uh, questions. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat in case you already think of questions so that we can pick them up later. Uh, and then without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Katja and Rosa. Uh, Katja and Rosa, I will give you uh, a signal uh, at about uh, 11. Eh? Uh, is that okay with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it will only take 15, 20 minutes to presentation. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Katja van Dungen, and with me, I also have my colleague uh, Rosa Sofitri. Uh, we work at uh, Wageningen Food Safety Research, uh, and today we will uh, present about food safety in food system transitions in deltas. Um, maybe you can hear it a bit, but I have a bit of cold, so uh, I'm sorry for that. But I will uh, do my best to give a clear presentation. Um, so who are we? So we are uh, both researchers at Wageningen Food Safety Research, with, which is a research institute, part of Wageningen University and Research. Um, and in our institute, which is located at the Wageningen campus in the Netherlands, we do a lot of um, research about the presence and occurrence or formation of certain uh, chemical hazards, microbial hazards and physical hazards as well in uh, food products to uh, ensure food safety. And we do research along the whole uh, food chain. So from farm to fork, but also beyond. So what happens in the human body? Uh, some more toxicology. Um, so within this um, Deltas Under Pressure uh, project uh, at Wageningen University in Research, which is led by Catherine, uh, we are also uh, involved. <clears throat> and as you may know, there are two case studies in that project, one in Bangladesh and one in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta region, uh, where um, yeah, Delta, the food system food systems in uh, these deltas are investigated also to uh, serve the sustainable development goal to, to end uh, hunger. Um, within this project, we are uh, mainly involved in the second case study in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta region. So that will also be the focus uh, of this presentation. Um, <clears throat> so what we do uh, in this uh, project in short is we look to the uh, effect of salinity and drought, especially as pressures on uh, primary food production systems in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta region and what kind of transitions or adaptation strategies can be implemented to, um, yeah, to mitigate or to uh, yeah, deal with these stressors. And we look uh, to that from a food safety perspective. So um, the connection between food safety and food security is very evident. So, for example, as also stated by the FAO, if it isn't safe, it isn't food. Uh, so food safety is actually really a part of food security. Uh, so not only um, yeah, needing a sufficient amount of food, but also safe and nutritious uh, food products. <coughs> so. Um, yeah, the idea of, well, to ensure food safety, uh, it is important to prevent food from containing substances, uh, we call these hazards, that could harm uh, human but also uh, animal health. And a hazard can be both a biological, chemical or a physical agent in food that can potentially cause 
adverse effect to human health. Um, for example, pesticides residues on your vegetables or fruits, uh, but also mycotoxins on your maize or cereals. Um, so I'm not sure what is uh, everyone's background, but a, a very sh small explanation about the difference between a food safety hazard and a food safety risk. <clears throat> so a hazard um, is a substance, or so that can be a chemical, but also a microbe that has the potential to cause harm. And the a food safety risk is then the likelihood that that certain hazard actually causes harm. So on this uh, image, you see, for example, a shark is uh, hazardous, so it has the potential to cause harm. But well, when the shark is very far away, the risk is um, uh, very low. <clears throat> And with food safety, it is also important, um, this very old statement, uh, that the dose makes the poison. So a hazard can um, be very uh, dangerous, but that can uh, occur at different uh, doses at a, um, yeah, how do you say, so at diff different concentrations, a substance can be uh, poisonous. <clears throat> So these are some basic uh, principles that we also use in our work. And in this project, um, <coughs> so in general, food safety is very important to evaluate from farm uh, to fork. So every stakeholder along the food supply chain is responsible to uh, guarantee that uh, food is safe for consumption. So uh, that goes from the beginning of the chain, so from primary production, so at farming level, until the food arrives at uh, the consumer's hand. So if there are changes along this uh, food chain, it is important to also uh, investigate the uh, impact on food safety. So within this uh, project, uh, we focus on the primary production systems and uh, we look, as already mentioned, to uh, the impact of these primary production systems by the driver salinity and drought in Delta areas, and then specifically in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta region. Um, and uh, we, in the whole project, there are several uh, adaptation strategies and transitions uh, that are studied, and we are uh, then looking to what do, do these uh, transitions uh, can have a uh, impact on food safety. And we do this by a food safety assessment uh, up front. So we think it is important to do this before you initi initiate a certain transition uh, so you can have a safe by design approach. So up front, you can well make sure that the transitions or the changes that you implement uh, are also uh, resulting in a safe food product. Um, so this is the uh, schematic approach of the uh, framework. So as you can see uh, on the left side, um, uh, the driver salinity and drought can have an impact on the current food system, uh, which uh, results in some certain transitions that can be initiated and that, result, that can result in a certain future scenario. And we are then um, involved in identifying uh, microbial and chemical hazards of these uh, transitions. And the idea of this is that it really serves as a uh, as an input to create awareness and dialogue um, so that, for example, uh, new food safety hazards can also be mitigated in the end. Um, so we apply this concept uh, to case studies where we focus on the primary production system. Um, and we did this <coughs> sorry, we did this based on uh, literature literature search and uh, internal expert uh, consultation. So it's important to mention that uh, what we did in this project is a, a theoretical exercise. Um, and uh, I will, oh yeah, and we focus on hazard uh, groups, uh, both microbial and chemical hazards, and that can include, for example, pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and parasites, uh, but also heavy metals, uh, certain plants and mycotoxins, pesticide residues, uh, veterinary drug residues, 
uh, but also environmental contaminants such as persistent organic pollutants or uh, such as uh, PFAS. Um, so we did this, uh, we applied this conceptual framework to three case studies. And these case studies were selected based on expert talks, uh, other activities within the project and on literature search. And um, we also uh, thought it was relevant to select case studies which well might have uh, a relevant relevance for food safety. So the first case study that we selected is the use of uh, different water uh, resources. Um, the second one is uh, moving from a monoculture to a integrated farming system, so more polyculture farming system. And the third one is the transition towards another crop. And here we selected uh, quinoa as a possible replacer for rice because um, it is more uh, salt resistant. Uh, but I'll explain that later. Um, and we applied the framework to the uh, to all the three case studies, but I will now present uh, some results of the first and the third uh, case study. So what we did to the water case is first we identified um, different water sources that are used in the current situation and we um, yeah, wanted to see how that can uh, be changed in a future scenario. <clears throat> so we selected, we investigated um, groundwater as a water source, uh, surface water from rivers, but also from secondary or tertiary canals, and uh, rain water that uh, has been collected to uh, be used. And we uh, did some literature search on the occurrence of chemical and microbial hazards uh, in these water sources. And then we, uh, well, for water, we mainly thought that uh, it is important that probably the source will itself will not be different, but the uh, application will mainly be different, uh, can be different when there is uh, a lack of fresh water, for example, um, that other waters or when the, when there's saline intrusion, that uh, other water sources might be used. Uh, instead of the current ones. Um, so we compared uh, the different water sources with each other and uh, identified the differences in the chemical and microbial hazards. Uh, and then in the end, uh, with that, we want to uh, evaluate what is the impact on food safety. Um, <clears throat> so this is table is the preliminary result of the uh, water case. So, um, on the y-axis, you see the um, yeah the water source that is referred to as the current situation. Uh, so we uh, investigated surface water from the river uh, and from canals, groundwater and uh, rainwater, um, and we compared the these sources actually to each other. Uh, and we did that for several hazard groups. And here are mentioned the pathogenic bacteria, parasites, viruses, cyanotoxins, heavy metals, and pesticides. Um, so a red um, square indicates that the uh, likelihood of a hazard uh, occurrence is po possibly increased. The gray uh, blocks uh, mean that it may, uh, remains similar. And the blue ones that it is possibly decreased. And of course, there are also some uh, parts that we could not find any data on. So uh, these are referred to as the white uh, boxes. So for example, what you can see here, if you compare the uh, rainwater with the uh, home uh, drilled wells groundwater, that uh, in the groundwater, the likelihood of most of the hazards is decreased. While, for example, for heavy metals, it seems to be increased. Um, yeah, we think also because of the uh, contact with uh, the soil. So this is one example of how uh, application of this framework um, yeah, gave us some results on possible uh, impacts on food safety. Um, and then we also applied this framework to uh, another crop, so to quinoa, as I already mentioned. 
so here we compared uh, Quinoa to um, the application to the use of uh, rice as the current situation. And quinoa was selected because it is a salt resistant uh, crop, a more, more salt resistant crop. And it is also studied within our project uh, by other um, researchers. So that also uh, aligns to each other. Um, and here, well, one thing what we thought is important to mention is that, of course, the uh, whole farm to fork process of the quinoa between ri with rice is uh, different. So from the cultivation to the harvest, but also to post harvest, uh, possible processing or storage conditions is different compared to rice. Um, so that is something to uh, consider. Uh, and there were also some uh, highlight uh, results is that we think it's important to uh, look more into the heavy metals um, uptake by quinoa. So it seems that it is uh, quite a heavy metal accumulator. Uh, however, it also seems that it might be lower in arsenic compared to rice. Um, however, there is also some more uh, research on that needed because there were not many studies found on this uh, matter. Um, and also, where do these chemicals end up? Do they mainly uh, end up in the seeds or in the leaves, uh, which can be uh, used for food or feed purposes? Um, another important point of attention is the uh, mycotoxins production. Uh, so also here, there was not much uh, data and literature uh, available. However, it is something that is uh, known for these uh, crops to be able to bear. So these are uh, toxins uh, produced by fungal species. Uh, so that can happen uh, also, for example, during post-harvesting uh, processes. So for example, storage. Um, and also the use of uh, fumigants such as ethylene oxide uh, was reported to be used in uh, quinoa, uh, especially then again in the uh, storage, um, which is also important to consider when a product is produced for local consumption or as an uh, export uh, product. Um, yeah, so to as an overall um, discussion of this framework, so we really see this as more a theoretical start exercise that um, stakeholders can do to have an idea of the impact of certain transitions uh, on food safety um, and the output can be used to support the transition or some decision uh, making processes or prioritization and uh, with this we hope to stimulate a safe by design uh, approach and with identification of um, food safety hazards uh, up front uh, people can also th think about mitigation of these hazards. So it's important to yeah, do that in an early stage. Um, it's of course also, uh, so the cases that we now uh, did were quite uh, general, but of course when you have a specific uh, local situation, you can get a more specific um, output. So many uh, factors play a role, such as the spatial uh, location, but also environmental conditions. Um, and then also the connection between human, animal and ev environmental health is, of course, very uh, prone and important. Um, and what is also yeah, wise to do is to verify it uh, also with actual measurements. So, for example, especially in the quinoa case, there's uh, also a lack of uh, knowledge on this uh, matter. So there's a need to also analyze uh, this. Um, and yeah, what you cannot really catch with such a theoretical exercise are, of course, uh, unknowns. So are there uh, new or emerging hazards uh, that can come up due to a certain combination of a spatial location and a certain crop, for example, um, that is not known yet. So this is also important to bear in mind. Um, and another point of attention, what I also just mentioned, is the difference between um, yeah, food products for the local market versus export products. So there can be different uh, regulations or requirements for uh, on the food safety of these products. 
However, I think still for public health concerns, it is important not to make a difference in that, but to be as uh, safe as possible. Um, so this is the, yeah, to wrap up this uh, approach. So the idea is really to do this assessment upfront to have a safe by design uh, approach. Um, and something else that I wanted to mention is that we also went to uh, the uh, Mekong Delta region in Vietnam in December uh, last year. Uh, we visited the Trafin University where we also had a workshop with researchers, farmers and uh, local authorities. So um, that was uh, so food safety was part of this workshop, but also other topics. But it really came uh, across that there is a yeah, very uh, big interest in food safety, also by the local authorities there. Um, and um, yeah, we also think that there might be a role for some on-site uh, analysis devices to actually have a uh, better uh, food safety control uh, system. So that is something that you can see on that picture with a um, yeah very simple device. You can, for some compounds, uh, screen and for some even quantify uh, their presence in some uh, matrices, which is very yeah easy to uh, use, which could be um, yeah something to further uh, explore. Um, and then I would like to uh, end with some questions for you. So what do you think? Uh, do you have food safety concerns when you think about food, about certain transitions in the current food system in deltas? And do you think that such a framework could help to understand the impact of changing food systems on food safety? And are there additional factors that we did not include or discuss now that are important to uh, consider as well? Or do you have other input? That's also, of course, very much welcome. Um, with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, involved in this project. And um, I would like to thank you for your attention. And yeah, we look forward to hear your thoughts, questions, or ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katja. Uh, big applause, a kind of virtual mm -hmm. applause. Um, but it's very interesting presentation. And you are well within the time, so that leaves a lot of time for questions. So uh, I think maybe it's good to have your discussion question back uh, as the, the, the slide. Yeah. Because this is a interesting one that you would like to have feedback on, right? Um, yeah. But let me nice. start with asking uh, if there are people having questions. Could I see hands or could you put something in the chat in case you like to ask a question to Katja and Rosa? Okay, I'm not seeing hands immediately. So then I'm kind of moving to this. Oh, Saladuddin, yes. Uh, Please come, uh, please come in, Saladin. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, along with this rates and hazard ideas, could you also consider the nutrition into it to strengthen the model, the approach? Uh, thank you for your question. So you mean, uh, to also include more the nutritional value of certain yes, food products? Of, yes, yes. As we are testing, you know, the different uh, negative impacts in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, toxins or anything. Together mm -hmm. with that, we could also add like whether we are increasing or decreasing the nutrition value of the crops that we are going to introduce or mm -hmm. yeah i think that is indeed uh also important add value, when you, yeah also when you talk about uh food security and i think that's something that can be included in um well if evaluating the case studies or identif identifying the transitions um but of course that is um yeah, something important that can be, yeah, how do you say, in the end, uh, be put together, right, in the decision-making uh, process, for example. 
um, yeah, so I think that can be that's something that can be uh, yeah can be added. I think that's not our expertise, but it is something that is indeed important to consider uh, as well. Interesting connection to to link to. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, question, Saladudin. Then I'm going to Paul Christiansen. Uh, you mentioned in the chat, Paul, that uh, food safety is a big issue in Vietnam. And also you mentioned about the water pollution and farming practices. Would you like to come in? Oh, I cannot hear you yet. Oh, you have a microphone problem. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry for that. Um, uh, am I right uh, that that you are uh, that your point about farming practices, um, uh, farming practices themselves are important, but also water pollution from industry and urbanization? Okay, I'm I'm going mm -hmm. to ask to Katja. That Katja, yeah. can you say something about water pollution from ur industry and urbanization in relation to your Mm -hmm. Food safety approach. Yeah, yeah. So uh, of course that is very important, and I think the the water is not very uh, clean there. So that is something that should be, uh, yeah, considered uh, as well by policy. So there are many. Um, well, I think not only in Vietnam but also here in the Netherlands is really an increasing problem that there is much more and more uh, pollution of chemicals in the water, which is um yeah which causes again problems when you use it for irrigation for example but also for drinking water um and especially uh, some persistent uh chemicals um that are also mobile and are toxic are yeah that's that's really a problem because they can uh move uh through the food system or through the environment um and yeah, they are also very persistent, so they are also not easy to get rid of. So I think that's really something that, <coughs> yeah, I don't know who, who is, yeah, who, I, well, I cannot solve that problem, I think, well, maybe in the lifetime, but I think that's really something that, um, oh, yeah, also the industry themselves should take responsibility that if you, um, if you, yeah, how you say if you pollute the environment, then in the end you will also get it back again. So that's I think the first uh, step. Um, and about farmer farming pr practices themselves, uh, I agree that that can also be an issue. So also when we paid a visit in uh, Vietnam, we also saw that actually next to the uh, deep well there were many packages of uh, pesticides um, that were used. They were just thrown in the environment there and then also again next to a deep well so yeah i think that the um the realization of people that that can be negative impact on the environment but also again on their own food system yeah that's also something that needs to be increased or um yeah or stressed yeah, and in this regard, then, eh, that because you mm -hmm. are not looking at production alone of food, but you are looking at the whole food system from the production up to the consumption with regard to food safety, then that also features very easily. Because when you're only thinking about the production, you might just wish to use the pesticides and just to increase the production. But if you also include the uh, element of consumption, and if those uh, production, uh, then the chemicals used for production are negatively influencing uh, uh, how you can consume the pro the product, then that's something what you want to yeah. address. So thank yeah. you very much for bringing that up. I like to move to um, uh, Mouchette. Um, Mouchette <coughs> Jalan uh, from World Fish. You are asking a question about the hazards. Would you like to come in with your question, please? You're on mute. No problem. Okay, okay. I always talk it. Um, 
the my question is when i am looking at the framework so mm -hmm. is there any way actually we can determine uh, you know the severity of uh, the impact of this hazard you know something like you know disease can be you know um, if we can monitor uh, you know a disease outbreak or something like that mm -hmm. uh, by which we can say that okay there is a severe impact of this kinds of hazard on human health that I think will be good, but you know, in the framework, I have not seen actually that. Uh, actually, in the framework, is that yeah. there are some reason, or 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 uh, you, you want to uh, do not want to monitor that, or you do not have the time to do that. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I agree that that is uh, also very important indeed, and indeed we did not include that uh, in this framework so far because. Uh, yeah, so it really depends per type of hazard how you can evaluate that. Uh, also, what is known about that to be able to evaluate that. So if you really want to do a proper risk assessment, you need to know the uh, identity of the hazard itself. So uh, really the hazard characterization, but you also need to be able to do an exposure assessment. So with that combination, you can do a risk assessment and you can actually try to uh, like yeah uh, hang a number to a certain uh, risk um, we decided not to do that also because um, yeah I think it, this is more important to yeah we just wanted to stress the importance of this in general uh, but you can definitely do that for specific cases I think then it becomes relevant but to do it more in a, a general general um, framework I think that's too um, yeah, difficult or out of scope of this project, but I think it is yeah a good point, and we can add it uh, in in any way in the discussion that that can be uh, yeah an additional step that you can do to yeah get more value out of it. Yeah, thank you for your comment. And and for this uh, for this additional step. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Katja, are you interested to team up with other people who might be on the call who are, uh, for instance, looking at a particular crop or fisheries or uh, other uh, part of food system? Um, and and uh, people can uh, communicate to you about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can of definitely send me uh, me or Rosa an email. So here are our email addresses. Um, and we are always happy to discuss uh, something, but to do really a proper risk assessment, I think that is a lot of, uh, yeah, well, that but, we well, need to Well, like you that. already <laughs> explained, uh, the first mm -hmm. thing is to kind of bring it in. Thinking from food systems, so it brings different people from different disciplines together. Yeah. So we can make the link to the food safety element, which is very important to yeah. everybody. Also, because for food security, we wanted it that food is safe and healthy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so then for doing a next step, uh, then we might kind of explore even on a small scale mm -hmm. uh, for a crop or a product. Yeah. Uh, what is then uh, the elements and uh, for some uh, uh, for some crop or produce, there is a very specific um, uh, hazard or risk which mm -hmm. is in perfume, like uh, for when, when you use uh, formalin for mangoes, for instance, that's one of the yeah. kind of critical things. Yeah. So in case there are people who like to link with you on that, we are this is a call yeah. uh, for people on that. Uh, and and yeah. maybe to ask your re reflection, uh, uh, Morshet, that uh, uh, because I see you nodding, uh, how is that for World Fish? Are you working on these kind of things? Uh, actually, no. That's why I'm uh, bringing this issue because we are working with the private sector uh, in, in Bangladesh. You know probably about the Bengal fish, uh, Bengal meat. Their name was Bengal mm -hmm. meat previously. Now they also uh, have a fish unit so uh, uh, renamed one unit as bengal fish so wh while actually they were doing this work when they communicated with the uh, government for you know marketing their products uh, government instructed them to go for a thorough you know check you know like the what's the impact of this chemical use uh, which is by yeah. uh, the farmers you know different kinds of things so i know that currently they are doing a study 
I think mm. they have completed, but I have not communicated with them. There are uh, different scientists, researchers from universities or private sector actors who are involved in this kinds of research. And I believe mm. that, you know, that's why I asked the question. I believe that for a single research, it's not possible actually to do everything, you know, alone. Yeah. But no. uh, it can be definitely linked with other researcher so yeah. if i have any uh, i mean uh, i can establish the communication i will definitely link um, uh, you know um, catherine you with uh, the uh, bengal fish the private sector team who are doing that study that that would be that would be very interesting indeed and good to hear that this kind of practical uh, yeah. way forward is people are already working on it yeah. and like katya is saying it's very very difficult if it need to be fully comprehensive but if there are examples of people who already explored something, how beautiful would it be if we could bring that together and learn from that um, and, and uh, work more on that? Um, are there other questions as well in the audience? Because I also had a question, but I need to wait, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not seeing any hands at the moment, so I take liberty to ask you a question. Uh, Katja, that about the uh, institutional arrangements with regard to food safety. Mm -hmm. uh, every country has 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 rules and regulations mm -hmm. on food safety. Uh, how, yeah. how how is where does that come in in your in your framework? Um, yeah, so I think that is um, the output of our of this framework can be used by policymakers, and they can then compare it to their own uh, regulations uh, and guidelines that they have. Um, so I think that that is the connection. Okay, thank you very but, much, yeah. uh, Paul. You also like to come in, please. Yeah, thanks. I've sorted out. I'm on my phone rather than the computer, so technical problems are solved. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, my, I had a comment question similar to that about the institutional. So I was really thinking about the high level policies, the, the sort of central policies, but also how they then get enacted or how they get um, actioned or whatever at the local level. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm Wondering how you're interact, who you're interacting with, um, you know, like in Javin or, or wherever you're going, um, in terms of the the local department, DARDS, the Department of Ag and Rural Development, and and other stakeholders that might be be interested in these sort of food safety issues. So, um, I think you know they're. So yeah, I guess who who are you involved with? Is it just the researchers and farmers, or government as well? And sorry mm -hmm. if I you've said that and I've missed that. Um, and then sort of thinking longer term, medium to longer term, are really, really around what's the capacity? How we will how will we build capacity? You know, from on the ground right up through through all of these stakeholders to have capacity, food safety. I mean, it's been around for a while, but um, often ignored or under under acknowledged how we're going to build capacity too and i know this is a complex long long process um, but thinking mm -hmm. about that too capacity building at the local level for monitoring for enforcing regulation um, or having regulation enforcing regulation and, um, and and developing positive pathways as well so i think capacity mm -hmm. is something that we really need to build um, yeah thanks okay Thank you for your questions. Um, so for the first question, uh, so so as I mentioned during this uh, visit in Vietnam, we interacted with farmers and researchers, but also with uh, the DART, so indeed the local authorities of that region. Um, and they were also very interested in, uh, in this topic. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so, so that is, um, so we discussed this then also with them. Um, but I think to, yeah, I think at such a local level, um, yeah, I think there there's maybe indeed not enough knowledge uh, available to be able to do that, or that should be then also maybe uh, stimulated from a more higher uh, level or in collaboration with other parties, uh, because you really do need some uh, specific expertise that is not 
yeah, very um, in, easy at hand always. Um, and then, yeah, how to build uh, capacity and how to uh, stimulate that at a more local level or, um, yeah, I think that's a very good question, but to me also a very difficult one. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know actually how to really uh, do that. So what we, uh, what we did uh, do during our visit is we also brought some uh, on-site testing uh, devices that we develop also in our lab here. So these are very easy um, to use uh, devices that you also, um, yeah, like with a similar approach that you use for like a COVID uh, test. So you can um, add some uh, liquid, for example, or an extract of a certain food product, and then you can see um, for some uh, compounds if it is present in that food product, yes or no. So I think that could be maybe on the longer term, uh, something that can be uh, implemented to also uh, have a bit more control of uh, on food safety, especially on the local uh, market. Um, but yeah, then again, you need to yeah select uh, for which hazards are you going to do that and why and for which food compound. So yeah, I think it's not so straightforward um, to just use that. Um, but that could be something maybe to further explore. Okay, you would you like to add to that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks, Katja. Um, it just, as you would think, uh, it made me also think then of the private sector uh, when you're talking mm -hmm. about that testing and whether companies can yeah. do testing and, and then it can come back through, through you know, premium payments or, I mean, there's organic and um, global gap, Viet gap and things like that. But even just um, th thresholds around... Yes. Um, residue levels and things like that so yeah i think private sector through to consumers sort of got a role to to have a bit of a pull rather than the push um thing yeah. too yeah yeah, yeah. thank okay. you okay and and maybe we can ask to the uh the the audience in hand that maybe other people are do you have experience uh like what katja is mentioning for instance to use testing at a local level uh to kind of um and with that to enhance uh, the safety of food. What is your experience in that? Anybody who like to share? Because if, from Bangladesh, I know that the, the, they, they do check on food safety and they do have a um, institutional arrangements for that, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't know, for instance, how that works in Vietnam. And uh, Katja, it may be interesting to kind of monitor how your equipment that you left, how it is used. And uh, I do not know for the AMD Vietnam case, but are people working with in the same area and do they have a link with what you do? That might also be interesting to know. Would somebody like to come in on that? Okay, well, the, your your email address is on the screen, so it may be that people will follow mm -hmm. up on that. Uh, and yeah. as you already said, there are many kind of complexities that easily will come in uh, because also that if something is harmful on a product at a certain moment, it may also be that three weeks later it is no longer harmful uh, and so then uh, the, uh, the risk is kind of gone uh, as well so the, 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 there is also a temporal uh, element to to your food safety uh, uh, in, yeah, in, the, in the process yeah or of course indeed what you do at home with it right if you uh, cook very well uh, on high temperatures then microbial pathogens will be killed yeah but that, that's a, yeah. so that also means yeah. that if if the product is very clean uh, and if that uh, makes that you have to cook it less long that would mm -hmm. save you a lot of energy right mm -hmm. that may also be important for consumers mm -hmm. or it may yeah. be a, a argument why they prefer a certain product but yeah. Uh, um, yeah like you already said that the, the food 
safety element and links very closely to other types of research because like what we're now discussing is about consumption and then it easily goes about a very detailed uh, consumption related research while uh, uh, just uh, kind of uh, 10, 15 minutes ago, we were talking about production and then there is a whole different group of researchers that you link to. So I can imagine also that that make it sometimes quite complex for uh, yourself and your team mm -hmm. uh, to work on this matter. Uh, how did you feel about that when you went to Vietnam? Was it helpful? that your colleagues from other backgrounds, uh, for instance, already made the contacts and did they make the right contacts for you? Uh, can you tell something about that? <coughs> um, yeah, I think it was very useful for us to uh, visit the area there in Vietnam because, yeah, then you have a very different view on how the food system actually is, or you have a better idea of how it actually works in practice. Um, so that was very useful and I also really liked to talk to uh, both farmers and uh, researchers but also to local authorities of course so in this project we really focus on the farming on, on farmer level but of course for this topic you you also would would also be interesting to uh, talk to companies uh, like more food processing companies for example um, but we did not uh, do that within this project, but that could, of course, also be very uh, relevant. Um, yeah, I and sorry, I think that was uh, yeah really uh, useful and and good to see uh, see that. But of course, the um, well with any project, it focuses uh, also a lot on agricultural processes, more uh, plant production systems for example and there of course you have different backgrounds different expertise so but yeah but that doesn't mean that it cannot give you valuable input right because it just has a different um, yeah so the background. so the experience yeah. for you was positive in that regard though your colleagues have very different backgrounds yeah of course uh, yeah no because yeah. what i'm noticing in in our total in our project team is that mm -hmm. um Food safety was not from the first moment a part of our focus. It kind mm -hmm. of came later. And then mm -hmm. it was a bit kind of searching for where, where yeah. that food safety element exactly fits. And then, uh, uh, but, but it was helpful for getting you in the picture, uh, kind of to link you to the practical case. And then uh, it's good to see that now uh, this practical situation helped to again uh, forward mm -hmm. uh, the framework um yeah are you planning to to publish the framework somewhere uh, so that yeah, people we, could re yeah. refer to it yeah we are working on that yes so we are planning to do that but that, that will not be on very short notice i think but yes okay but people can kind of communicate yeah. to you to know more yeah, about sure. it yeah. paul i see sure. your hand what would you like would you like to come in <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, it just reminded me of the, at, at Chavin Uni, there's some really good people that are involved in kind of um, biz, agribusiness innovation and entrepreneurship. And they, mm -hmm. if you sort of wanted to get some links and have conversations with uh, innovative um, agribusinesses, that I can give mm -hmm. you some names of people okay. at Chavin Uni. There's one particular guy, I, I'll have to find it on my computer, but. Yeah, there's a lot of, oh, there's not a lot, there's little bits of innovation going on a, a, yeah. around sort of green green um, farming and so on. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you very much for raising this Thank point. Uh, and uh, and also very, very good that the, the young generation of scientists is straight away uh, very close um, linked to you. Um, <laughs> you also asked in the chat the name of the testing meters and whether they are available commercially or whether they are just for research. Katja, can you say something about that? Um, yeah, at this moment, they are just available for research. So not uh, commercially available, as far as I know. Yeah. OK, so if so you need is... more details, Paul, <laughs> feel free to drop Katja a line so that you can um, know something more about it. Uh, and anybody who has um, 
uh, either information or experience with uh, with this kind of uh, testing equipment uh, that may be interesting for Katja, so feel free to make the link. Okay, uh, final round, uh, because I don't see any further questions. No, that's correct. Okay, uh, then uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank you, Katja and Rosa, uh, very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you to the audience uh, for raising uh, your questions and bringing in your experiences. Uh, very happy to learn about that. Um, for our next Delta Talks in June, the date is 26th of June, uh, and uh, an invitation will be shared shortly. In case you uh, are not getting the invitations, please knock Eisen about it or send an email to anybody of us so that we can link you up so that you can be placed on the list uh, and the topic of the next uh, Delta talks will be digital climate advisory services. So that promises to be a very different topic, but again, a very interesting discussion. Thank you all very much and Thank have you. a good day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.